Great. A lot of people are still here. Now we are going to have a panel on the topic of auto agitation and I'm really happy to welcome all of my guests. First of all, again, the two directors, please have a great applause for Ivana Mladenovic and Olivia Bazemir. Please join me on stage. <laughs> you can choose wherever you feel comfortable sitting. <laughs> yeah. You will sit next to him, please. And we have two other wonderful guests today. Um, please welcome with me, um, first of all, Dorota Lech, Lech, sorry. Um, can you come on stage? Dorota is a programmer. She's the head of the section Discoveries at the Toronto International Film Festival and also the international programmer for <laughs> Central and Eastern European films. And she's in charge of the forum at the Hot Dogs Festival, a pitching event for documentaries. She's all about emerging and new and experimental and exciting cinema. And I'm also incredibly happy to again welcome on the stage to the Critics Week, um, Girish Shambu. Girish, where are you? I don't see you. Girish is a blogger and a film critic. And he writes for outlets like Census of Cinema and Film Quarterly. And he is not here. Probably he went to the toilet. I don't know. Uh, ah, he's coming. Girish, <laughs> please join us on stage. Girish was already on stage yesterday at the conference where it was a about one of his ma major works. He wrote a manifesto called The New Cinephilia, and he had a, a talk yesterday. And uh, just one other word, Girish is not only a film person, but he's mainly, or also in his professional life, a professor um, for, now I learned, um, non-sustainability, unsustainability, <laughs> um, at the Canisius College in Buffalo, New York. Thank you very much for being here, wonderful. So let's dive right in. Um, I already said some words about auto agitation and I don't want to bother you with a lot of theor theoretical remarks. We, are one, we want to talk about a, little, uh, a little bit about a kind of restlessness, about a kind of state of being that gives us control that might be productive but that also might be an obstacle. Um, it could be good for creative work but it also could be a hindrance in social endeavors. So I would directly jump in and um, start with Ivana because the film is still fresh in our memory. Ivana. Um, if I can ask you this question, <laughs> you can uh, take anyone and pull it up. If I can ask this question very bluntly, Ivana, are you sometimes annoyed by Ivana? Um, I mean, yes, of course. I, w I would say yes. Very, very simply yes. And if we're talking about uh, auto agitation, I'm so agitated right now that you're gonna get the real thing, probably. <laughs> well, then okay, let's let, 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 let's go, <laughs> let's go there. You're agitated in what way? Let's uh, let's try to to find a way to I specify agitation. I wouldn't go into <laughs> analyzing my uh, character right now. I did it in the film, but um, like uh, what uh, I was agitating other people, and in the same uh, and at the same time I was agitating agitating myself I guess so that that would make me agitating person yeah the, the people in the movie are your real family and uh, you are working with them so you are agitating yourself and your family was it a kind of a like a theoretical poetical thing to go into this process or was it more like an aesthetic experiment aesthetic experiment yeah, to, get, to see what will come out of uh, working with your family. I don't know. I mean, it really, the way it started was uh, just because I really wanted to see what was going on because I wasn't feeling, uh, I was very agitated uh, with my previous film. It's called Soldier's Story from Ferentari. And it um, actually, when the film got out, uh, it was a lot of like uh, even threatening messages and a lot of protests against the film. And maybe when I started working on that film, I thought that it might be like that. But until you make the film, there are three years and you get used to this topic and then eventually you need to show the film. And I guess I, I kind of got not scared, but uh, very agitated. So I had to go back to my parents. I wasn't feeling so well. And I started writing this script. I your parents' place? Yes, in my hometown at my parents' place okay. because I really needed somebody to take care of me. And um, I started writing this script and um, I realized that a lot of things that were, uh, that I thought that there were some kind of diseases or like s illnesses, sicknesses, that it all kind of came from these panic attacks and anxiety. So by writing it, I was uh, literally trying to figure out what it was. And, and then, of course, I proposed, uh, proposed to them and uh, it became an experiment, but like a very aware 
one. That's what we are doing. So uh, I really like um, when I watch the movie now again, I, I see there is also like it, it starts already with this conversation with the people who are into yoga. And there is this question to find calm, to uh, to find peace. At the same time, everybody is always like saying, "Relax, you know, um, calm down." So is there like a how do you say a stressful uh, equilibrium between a person's inner longing to be calm and a per uh, like the people from the outside who make it impossible by forcing her to become calm? I know that it it uh, looks like I it was something that I really thought what putting this scene, but it really happened. <laughs> like uh, in, in the train, you mean? Yes, it really happened. I was really agitated. I was on my way home, and they really started talking about it. And they were talking also about it, like how much they hate these people that are uh, organizing this yoga meeting uh, across the Danube in their hometown. So there were a lot of things that were also happening with my film and what they hated about their yoga meeting. So it was really st strange. At the same time, yes, the, the, the couple, the, the mother and the, the son, they were over there and they were going for, for this meeting and they were giving me their apples and their mouse and they were, everybody are talking about being calm. And I think that I, for them, I looked like a total freak because I, I was obviously not calm. And yes, of course, I, there is a need for people to, to have this equilibrium. Yeah. They need to label it in a way. They need to say, oh, now, now you're calm, now you're agitated, now you're... But actually it's... Do, do they need it to like uh, be more reassured about their own state of being? Are we all like agitated Probably, and crazy and it's easier to see other people or to make other people crazy? I don't know about ourselves? other people. I just talk about myself. <laughs> but probably yes. Okay. Um, I, like in afterwards, I would really like to go a little bit more into also the social implications of your movie because it, it like you you talk also a lot about like something like national identities and collectives on different levels, the family, the town. Um, but um, let's stick to the process um, for a last question. Um, like the char it's a little bit hard to talk about it. Ivana in the movie. Yeah. Uh, um, Ivana in the movie um, is in a very destructive phase, and um, she comes from a very dark place. Um, now you, y it's three years later, you watch the movie, was it like a productive experience, this destructive uh, phase that you had to go through? Is it something, let put it, let's put it a little bit more concretely, are you lo now looking back thankful for the stress you had to endure? Some of the parts, yes. Not, not all of them, but some of the parts, yes, of course. I realize that you, sometimes you need to go through, through stuff. Okay. To, I don't know, that, that will be it. Okay, great. Uh, Oliver, I would uh, now switch to you, if that's okay. Um, your movie, uh, and I say it in a good way, confused me again that I watched it. Um, there is a lot that you like deliberately don't show or show in a weird way. Uh, when there is action happening, all of a sudden we see still images. Um, you go to Bordeaux and then you tell me, I'm not going to show you what you want to see from Bordeaux. I'm going to stick to the uh, suburbs. Um, so was that something that, you know, um, is it carefully constructed or, some, uh, or was it more like a spontaneous thing that happened while you were there? And I'm talking about the, 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 the shooting moment. Yeah, it was pretty spontaneous actually. I, I went there to uh, a friend, friend of mine were putting up a hardcore punk festival and they invited me over because I was living in Bordeaux for some time, like five years ago, now six years ago. And I came and to have an excuse for myself to get away from my work, I told them that I'm going to shoot a documentary there. And so this was also the, cho so the, the choosing the material, the SVHS material. It had to relate to that punky scene back there. And I was at the festival. And I, I didn't feel like filming. I didn't feel like shooting because I hated these situations for all my life when I had to do something, um, even if I put have put myself into that situation. But my friends were waiting for something to happen, like me acting, and at the same time this was the... You acting as a filmmaker. Yeah, me acting as a filmmaker. And there was this Yellow West protester thing going on, which I was really like into it from Germany, like from far away, and I just had a little daughter, so I couldn't go to join the movement and my friends. And then I just started filming, and because I was living there five years ago, I just started randomly filming all these places that were not existing anymore. And I felt like I was really like agitated all the time by what's going on. And my friends, they were pretty calm about it, which I didn't understand. Had it been going on for some time already in Bordeaux? Yeah, yeah. This was like last year in April, March, April, something like that, 2019. So it's been going for four months now. 
and they took me to that demonstration and actually r nothing really went was going on and then for no reason the police started pointing guns into the into the crowd and i really feel threatened felt threatened like very much and i came home and i thought about doing that documentary for my friends and it didn't work out so I, when i watched the material i just randomly took all these images um, and I felt like they're putting their selves together and then I started editing and yeah, it was really some yeah so if I if I ask you to shoot a concert for movie for me this is a, uh, w what might come out yeah I, I mean if you pay me I will probably okay. deliver <laughs> something <laughs> but, um, yeah it was more <laughs> No, then uh, finally, when I started editing, I, th I I felt like I I've been filming things that I would have n would have not been filming if I would have thought about it before, like in a longer process. If I was really going there to make a documentary or like make an essay movie about the Val Yellow Vest protesters, and so I just had to stick with the material that I t that I just randomly got, like randomly. It was not randomly at all, of course. But um, I, it felt a little bit like that. And I was using it just for my friends. So I felt no pressure at all from production backgrounds and stuff like that. I had no art school idea behind it. I was just doing it in that very moment. And it feel, felt great to let that out. And then when I finally had the images arranged, I started like writing a text because I thought something was missing. And as you see right now as well i can't take myself like very short i i just always talk and <laughs> so please stop <laughs> no no uh, that's that's good makes my job a lot easier um also again like um, your movie is a very dense commentary on uh, like uh, political social cultural issues and i would like to maybe get back on these more broader claims and just once more like go more to the material of the film and um honestly speaking the blowjob images they uh, are disturbing to me they provoked me and i wanted to ask they you should they be. provoke you too yeah they hella provoked me um actually when i bought the camera and the uh, um the cassettes there was some pornographic material on it so um yeah, I just started shooting there, and later when I digitalized it, it found its way in the digitalized versions, version, and I was really shocked by seeing it. Like, um, and I didn't like the material at all, and I felt very like unsecure what to do about it. And then I started editing, and at some certain point, it really found it w its way into the Yellow West protesters demonstration, which was really uh, like, like the material. Yeah, th this was really like by incident. I wouldn't. I would have never used some kind of material in, in any of my films because I know about the whole discourse about like sexual, uh, whatever. Uh, like, w yeah. And then I felt like um, these images were really saying something to me in that very moment. And I was thinking a lot about it. And then I took them out and I watched the film again and I felt something was really missing there. And um, I took them back in and actually they agitate me uh, I get ashamed when I watch the film especially when I watch it with a big crowd like I'm really blushing when I'm seeing it and for some reasons uh, when I do my films and I edit I always want to have the people to get distracted to get out of the moving images scene so this is also why I use that music in a way um, I really want people to feel uncomfortable, to feel their bodies and really think about what the fuck am I seeing? Like, okay. fuck you is also like the end of the film. So I think uh, this was especially <laughs> for my friends, like the punk rock scene. But yeah, I <laughs> yeah. thank you. Um, so let me turn to this side. I don't know. There wasn't a very clever way of positioning. I guess I always have to like ignore half of my panel. <laughs> Maybe we have to. Uh, like move around a little bit. Um, Dorota, if I'm allowed, I would like go now to you and stick to the movies and get a little bit meta, so to say, uh, because as you have heard, the Critics Week is kind of self-interrogating their decisions. Um, you as a programmer, this decision to program these two movies together, can you spontaneously, like, w what do you think about these decisions? Honestly, I'm I'm so messed up right now by Oliver saying that he put someone's porn in his movie. <laughs> just, it's like, like all I can think about, to be completely honest. I would love to come back to that. Um, to answer your question. And, uh, just uh, let me like procedurally say again, if you felt in that moment to say something, please do. Uh, like, like I just did? Uh, yeah, like um, <laughs> also just like you could have said it 30 seconds before. Oh, okay. But yeah, let's get back to the question. Uh, I mean... Yeah, I guess I'm. I'm curious. I don't know if the if the programming came from 
the concept or the concept was made after the programming? I don't know if you have any insight about that. If Audutation was... I like specifically did not ask. You did not ask. Um, I mean, like, if, if that was the top... I, I kept thinking, because I've seen both films both times now, and the first time I really didn't understand the connection between the two topics. I don't know, I'm really jet-lagged. Maybe I was just watching them in, like, a haze. And now the the provocation aspect definitely makes sense to me. I don't think it was programmed to like specifically agitate the audience, I wouldn't think. I, I think it's actually a really natural thread throughout the films of filmmakers questioning what they're doing. And is that something like um, that you are interested when you're looking for films, uh, that uh, filmmakers go through this also a little bit painful process and try to uh, put it on uh, like uh, on celluloid or VHS? Uh or digital media, like um, that, that you have the feeling that there is some some kind of uh, valley of suffering that you have to go through in order to get something aesthetically or politically um, interesting. No, I don't think you need that. But to be honest, like I don't think I've ever met a filmmaker who isn't suffering in in some ways in making their film. Like I don't, I don't, I don't, I have not met that filmmaker yet. <laughs> Would probably make for boring filmmaking. I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> do they exist? Maybe that's the question. Maybe they don't. I don't know. Uh, Girish, uh, if I could play the same game a little bit with you, um, addressing you as a film critic, um, one should always be wary to, uh, um, you know, um, follow the ideas of directors, what they think about their own movies. So, like, um, just you as a film critic who watch the movies now freshly, can you share a little bit of your thoughts? Um, I'm also specifically asking with, you know yesterday's talk in our head um, you know that you watch films in a very specific way and also ask questions about um, representation of uh, sexes and uh, about like um, the to, to be careful what kind of images to put so yeah um, I would say that uh, with reference to what you uh, what you said about yesterday's talk where we talked about uh, autorism the auteur and uh, um, patriarchal culture which we've had for the last you know uh, for a long time and film culture has been firmly uh, male dominated for over a hundred years since the invention of cinema so I would say that when I see a film like Ivana's it's um, to me it's inevitable uh, to see it in the context of a history of cinema that's mostly male you know and so I see this um, a woman's film and I also uh, uh, remember the history of cinema in that uh, so many um, predominantly so many of the images made in the first several decades of cinema were made by men and they were rich expressions of male existence but they often tend to objectify women and flatten their lives and not really render them in the richness that men's lives were rendered in um, so one of the reactions to that was when women started making films in greater numbers, there was a demand for strong female characters. You know, this has actually now become an acronym on Twitter. They call it SFC for strong female character. So, but the problem with that is it again creates a false ideal of a woman who's always strong all the time. And so it really um, affected me that Ivana's character was so... Um, W was struggling with, uh, with with issues all through the okay. film, and as you know, and, and and the fact that you weren't believed that really made me angry. The fact that you were discredited um, by everyone, you know, in your in your family and by your former boyfriend and ev everybody around you, and they project their own problems back on you by saying your dad saying, "Hey, th these pills worked for me for two years. You should try these pills because you have exactly what I have." Which of course he doesn't know that. But um, so this kind of discrediting, there's now a name for it in American pop culture. They call it gaslighting, <laughs> based on the movie Gaslight, which uh, from the 1940s, in which Ingrid Bergman plays a wife who's never believed by her husband, and who and who whose husband thinks that uh, whose, whose husband tries to convince her that she's going crazy. And so um, all of these thoughts kind of came into my head in relation to the history of cinema and the way that you know men have made films and now the way women are slowly starting to make films in ways that are, you know, um, women are being allowed to make films about a wide range of characters. 
And um, is that like when, when when you watch a movie like this against this backdrop of all those images that we have? Is it like um, do, do you feel it liberating? Do you feel that like uh, it is it is challenging because you yourself, as we all, have this heavy heritage that we fight against? Would you say that you are already like transcended that? Or is it like um, always like if you, if you see a new kind of representation, um, challenging to to uh, accept it? Yeah. So even uncomfortable representations like Ivana's film, which you know so often is so uncomfortable to watch, and you can an empathetic person projects themselves into you and what you're going through throughout the film, and um, so even though it's it's very um, uh, uncomfortable. I, I also felt a thrill from the fact that these are new images in cinema that, you know, most of most of the century, the last century of cinema has deprived us of images like these made by women. And so there's pain and discomfort, but there's also a certain thrill of watching a new kind of cinema. <laughs> so with all this, uh, these uh, It's like actually very funny words. what you're saying because I remember that the film didn't from the beginning have uh, the title Ivana the Terrible. It was actually inspired from a Margaret Duras book. Uh, it was called Summer Night Half Past Ten. But I remember uh, with my producer, she started sending the film to different sales agents. And they were saying, oh my God, this character is so annoying. You know, I know Ivana and she's so, such a nice person in life, but on screen she's so annoying. And I said, we wanted that and it wasn't like by mistake. So we felt the need to help the film. So, you know, while you're talking about you labeling. You picking the title, yeah, I was helping the film. I think so, because uh, we were just trying to give people, you know, what we thought about it and how she's going about it, that everybody are telling her that she's terrible and okay, I know it, it's fine. But, uh, um, you know, they, they just didn't get it that way at the beginning. They just said uh, she's such an annoying character. So, so you like, mean okay. like picking this title was a little bit catering to the, to the way the know. industry works? It's a funny thing, but you can <laughs> ask, you know, like it's, 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 this is the way it happened. You know, it, uh, when we gave the title to the film, I think that it really helped for people to you know, get where we are going to. It's just they didn't get it from the beginning, I guess. If I'm allowed to, I would just like quickly uh, ask Dorota if that is something like considerations of title, considerations of like how the industry is like primed, like w what to pay attention to and what not. Um, is that something that um, you you develop strategies to to be resistant to? Because I guess that you come across um, a lot of films, and you um, you also know that you know producers, distributors, they 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 offer them in a certain way. Um, are you are you careful um, not to fall into the trap of the market? I don't think I you can use yeah. this one. Sorry. Sorry. I don't I don't think I'm actually like resistant to anything. I don't know. I I I think I'm a really open person when I watch any film, and I don't come from a background of cinema. I've never taken a film class in my life. I just have like always watched a lot of film and I've always been I don't watch that much American film to be honest I should, I don't know. but I've always been open to a lot of cinema from around the world so I was thinking about what you said Grish and it, it's so funny because I I can think of so many examples of, of strong female films from way before Ivana made Ivana the Terrible but I was trying to reflect on if I know a film specifically of a director that casts herself in this way that's like both completely strong but also like really irrational and, and terrible, I guess. I don't know. I also am resistant to say terrible because I was watching your film and I was like, am I like this? Should I call my parents? Like, I just, <laughs> like, I, I think it's possible that sometimes we're, we all kind of behave like this with our families. I don't know, maybe everyone's like lovely and I'm I'm also terrible. <laughs> But no, I mean, titles have titles have nothing to do with it for me. There, there, there are times because we watch hundreds and hundreds of films a year where you'll see the same title reflected a bunch of times and you're like, why does everyone want their film called like, Let There Be Light? <laughs> You know, but other than that, no. <laughs> so Ivana, um, let me make good on my promise uh, uh, um, and ask you a little bit um, about uh, the broader social aspects uh, your your film touches upon. Let's maybe first start with the family. Um, the role of the woman in the family, uh, which is something that I have the feeling your character and your movie pushes back against on the one hand. On the other hand, there is a very positive uh, picture of family. Like, um, there is a lot of love. 
uh, between the people. A lot of love that is also like like achieved through struggle. Um, so what I wanted to ask you, and also coming back a little bit to the topic of auto agitation. Um, Family as an institution, does it need to be provoked a little bit to see um, what what emotions are real and where we like try to manipulate each other? And how was the process of making this movie maybe a cathartic process to to go with your family through this kind of process? I'm, I'm sure it was because before that I was telling them you don't love me, <laughs> you don't love me <laughs> at all. And when they did this for me, I just couldn't say them that to them anymore because I think this was the biggest, you know, sh they're showing love for me because they accepted to do this with me. So I think in, from that point of view, I think it was cathart cart not cathartic, but it was like beneficial for for both parts. And yeah, like um, I mean, it is true that uh, like my I. From my point of view, because as I, uh, as a character in the film says, when you want to talk about a family, it's how you perceive them, not necessarily how the family really is. Because if somebody else make a film about my family, they would probably make a different film. But this was definitely from my struggles. If my mother would make a film from her point of view, it would probably be that I'm an ungrateful kid or something, something else. But because it was my struggles that I was going through, it had to be from my point of view. So they were going through through my experience, the way I see it. And it was kind of it was kind of weird because they said that half of the stuff didn't happen that way. <laughs> and when we I mean even because we, we wrote the film and of course I was writing with Adi, the, the writer, Adi Skiop, he is the writer that on my previous film, that he also acted himself in in the film. So I already went through this process of putting someone that went through something to, to play in it. So this time we decided to do it with me and he has a more of a cynical way of uh, seeing life, I guess. And I guess that he also saw me the way I didn't see myself. And he said, oh, you're doing these things. And I, first time I went with, with him through this process and I was saying, I'm not acting like that. And then when we wrote it, I went and I read the script with my parents and because they had, it was no improvisation. We, they had to learn the lines. And they were actually learning their own lines. And they were saying, this is not how it happened. So it was uh, all the time I was reassuring them that it wasn't like it happened, but it was it was very strange because they didn't want to accept it. But eventually, there were some scenes that were not in the film that were maybe a little bit more painful, you know, for for the film. But they didn't somehow end up in the film because I think they were a little bit more fictionalized, so they they didn't find the place. But there were some really uh, strong issues when my, my mother told me that I should be ashamed for what happened, stuff like that. And eventually I didn't feel the need to put it because I thought that it was from my point of view, maybe because that word hurt me more than maybe she thought that it should hurt me. So I, I try to find the right balance, even though we're fighting a lot, there, there is something that keeps us together, I guess. But it's more of a Balkan thing. I think that a lot of people from Balkans watching this film, they said that it's, this is how it is in my family as well. I don't know. That, okay, now you're getting exactly to what I would be curious yeah. about because um, uh, transcending a little bit your personal uh, family history, what makes this movie so touching and revealing for me is that you are, um, to a certain degree, sh showing a figure that is deeply pro problematic, um, which is the hysterical woman, so to say. And at the same time, I have the feeling the movie offers me a way to see how it's produced by uh, the people around her and by society. Um, I don't know if it, this is something that you... If, if for you this is really a very personal experience, or if you also have like this, if you s take a step back and think about Ivana in the movie as a product of society because also gossip is uh, you know a very important issue i just wanted to ask you a little bit more about this this yes because not uh, not pressure. all the the things that happened in the film were only my uh, experiences like the gossip on the beach was something that happened to a friend of mine that, that gossip never happened to me so there were a lot of a lot of talks with different girls from my hometown and they were like saying you should put this and you should put that but that's very dangerous you know when people start going on you should put this and that it's very it can be I mean, of course I went from my point of view, but of course I wanted to show how it is for, for a girl from... So, like, um, if I get it right, your character in the film is to a certain degree a composite yes. of um, you making interviews or talking to um, not women. Just talking, not interviews. Just okay. talking. Just talking. Friends, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and also, um, Oliver, um, also your movie, we talked a little bit about aesthetics and about the process, how you actually made it. Um, but now the form and the... Yellow West protests, like it's a it's a sharp cut. Uh, but um, 
uh, also a little bit about the social implications um, that your movie hints at. It was perceived as a very angry movement, um, a very irrational movement. And um, I have the feeling that uh, your movie, to a certain degree, also has this anger, this a little bit hard to understand why this anger all of a sudden pops up. Um, so I wanted to really ask you how you relate the process and the product to the Yellow West movement and what you understand is relevant, what happened there on the streets. Oh, wow. That's really a, Sorry. Big, that's really a big question. And I've, um, yeah, this, uh, first of all, I wanted to clarify that, of course, when I was saying a lot of words like randomly and stuff like popped in and it was just by chance and stuff like that, I really made that film intentionally, like after I figured out what that material is telling me. And so talking about my rage um, was that <coughs> I have sometimes the feeling that there's been a lot of things that are like common knowledge right now, like uh, like politically politically spoken and socially spoken, and even the other side knows all the arguments. And then in the end, um, the people still go on the street and they do something that might be irrational. And the people who are sitting in the positions to decide things, um, politics as to say, for example, they're feeling like threatened by it because they say it's irrational. And that's, this is exactly what happened with the Yellow West protesters. They had a very good reason to go out on the streets. And so this is why I'm saying this is a very big question because you can't really grasp what they are going for. You can't just say they, the people, they are agitated because they feel there's a social problem coming up. So when I was making the film, I felt very moved by this, that even like right wing and left wing people and young people and old people, workers and non-workers were walking together and they really felt no responsible anymore for what is about to happen because they, f they f didn't fucking care about anything anymore. And in that very moment when I was there and even thinking about it before, but feeling that I felt like, why do we always have to like argument in that way that we know that the other side is gonna say that and this and that, you know? And why not just go for it at one certain moment and then talk about it afterwards, what we are doing right now, so. So like if, if, I, if I can try a little bit bluntly to uh, put what you said, back to the topic of the evening, auto-agitation. It's like this deliberate going into a place of insecurity and also maybe irrationality. Is that something that, that you find productive? To say, like, I don't have all the answers. I cannot just, like, decipher you quickly what is, like, the historical and political s uh, circumstances that produce this, but I can, like, go to where, where it hurts. Like, go into a space of irrationality. Is that something that you, that you would uh, think this is what your movie is also about? I think we should more actually go into these situations and I mean we've all we are all thinking a lot and we're doing a lot about it and we're talking a lot but then I think in some certain moments thinking and talking and everything is just not enough anymore and then you just should just choose to do something and even if you don't know if the outcome is right so um, Actually, a couple of years ago, I got really impressed by one talk that I watched online between Foucault and Noam Chomsky, and they were really arguing each other. And there's this certain point at the end of this discussion. It was held in the 17s, I th 70s, I think, in the Netherlands. And Chomsky is really saying, like, why do you want the people to go out and just destroy things like irrationally? And Foucault said, like, basically. Um, yeah, you you cannot build up something new if you're still um, putting it in the words of the old. You at sometimes you have to really cut loose. And then Chomsky is really getting upset, and he's saying like, "But what if this goes to another dictatorship or fascism?" And Foucault is just sitting there, and he says like, "You can't help. You m I mean, you just have to at least try in that very moment." Like because when you're agitated at that level and when something is really going bad and you feel it, then you just really have to. Does that answer Thank your you. question? Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, Dorota, if I can uh, address you um, then quickly, we are going into a political uh, realm now and also how cinema reacts to it. Um, you are an expert on Central and um, Eastern European cinema and uh, like I just wanted to ask you now also with the introduction that we had today with the uh, political problems that we are facing in Europe. Do you have the feeling that um, d 
uh, are movies reacting to this political reality in a very specific way lately, uh, lately namely xenophobia, racism, uh, exclusionary um, tendencies? Is that something that you, that, that you encounter a lot in cinema, that they tackle these political issues head on? I mean, some, some things do, but m one of my concerns as a curator, and I, I'd be really curious if you feel the same, like I don't think there should be a, any pressure on artists of any kind to do any films that are reactions or actions of any kind. I think there's definitely a space for art for art's sake, there's a space for activist films, and there's a space for anyone who feels the the need to express themselves. Now, whether, you know, of course, festivals and you know, commissioning editors and people in the zeitgeist feel like they need to discuss certain topics, especially in Europe where commissioning editors are still really strong. Uh, you know, the types of films that actually get paid for, probably they're, it's, it's easier to get a film financed if it's, you know, about whatever's happening in that country at that time, whatever the national government, whether a right-wing government or left-wing government um, is supporting. You know, like there are certain countries, like the one I'm from, where um, it's it's a really right-wing government and the films that are, I'm from Poland, <laughs> I should have, I'm from Poland, um, and the films that are being financed now tend to be a lot more um, historical a little bit and kind of a retelling of things that, you know, support the national dialogue of what it means to be Polish or what this current government thinks it means to be Polish. Now, I don't think that's, that who pays for films has anything to do with the kind of art that filmmakers necessarily want to be making, and I just, like, come from a place of wanting to be sure that all art is being, all art is, is, Possible, I guess. Yeah. So, an egalitarian standpoint, um, you, you don't want to like like um, put like topics uh, or um, like politics um, in front of your curating decisions. Yeah, definitely not. And the, I mean, you you when you introduced me, you referenced that I run a program called Discovery. The it's the Discovery program at the Toronto International Film Festival. It's a debut section, and the purpose of the film, the the section is. Sorry, I'm so jet lagged. I feel like I'm on the moon right now. <laughs> <laughs> So the purpose of the section is is auteur filmmakers. It's searching for the auteur filmmakers of the future. So what I'm looking for is entirely directorial vision and story. It could be from any country. It could be from any perspective. It's really about how someone makes their art. That's what I'm most interested in, personally. Thank you, um, Girish. If I'm allowed to just uh, um, pick up, uh, like like use Dorota's um, suggestion and give this question to you, um, the question of. Um, in your in your manifesto, um, um, you you put a lot of emphasis also on the question of representation, but you do it in a very like complex way. Um, it's um, a representation of uh, um, human realities that have been excluded for a long time from the cinema screen. But at the same time, um, uh, like uh, uh, if you, if you ask for representation, you're also asking to react to something that is like politically like like happening at the moment or that is a active reality. So would you a little bit disagree on this point with uh, Dorota or would you emphasize it or phrase it in a different way? Um, I would say that um, there's a range of uh, political presence in cinema uh, from explicit to Im implicit. So a lot of films that might appear not to be very political are actually political when you start to think about them and talk about them. And I think that's the, uh, one of the great benefits of dialogues such as this. So for instance, I find Ivana's film uh, and, you know, and Oliver's film, both films, to be very political. Oliver's film is m a little more explicitly political, and Ivana's film is very implicitly political. Uh, some might even say explicitly so. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a simple detail that popped into my head when I was watching the film. Uh, recently, a big study was done um, in America on Hollywood films that tracked the age difference between male uh, and female roles in romantic comedies. And you'd be stunned at the age difference. Harrison Ford being paired with somebody 40 years younger, Al Pacino being paired with somebody 30 years younger than him, all of this completely normalized in, in film culture. And so, uh, to me, Ivana's film is also a social critique of this kind of, um, you know, um, these kinds of standards, patriarchal standards. So why is everybody giving Ivana a hard time because she's dating somebody 13 years younger? What, what's the big deal? But then everybody, it is a big deal for everyone in the film. And so I, I find this kind of social critique of institutions in her film, like 
the, the, the couple, the family, and also this myth of Romanian-Serbian solidarity and unity, which is a wonderfully absurdist and funny. I mean, I don't know much about Serbian-Romanian relations, but I do know that the story that they were telling at the celebration was nonsense. You know, it, it, it just seemed absurd to me. And so uh, it's also like a deconstruction of all these myths that we hold up to be true. You know, the family is sacred. Um, uh, uh, countries are sacred. Um, and uh, har harmony between countries is sacred. So I, I liked how it was unpacking all of these ridiculous myths. So that's, I think, part of the social and political critique of Ivana's film. And this also ties in with Oliver's film because of the great line about adapting is surviving, mm -hmm. and then the refusal to adapt in Oliver's film, and then the pressure on Ivana to adapt to all of these standards that are placed on her by people in society. So I think the films work together well on that level. To adapting is dying. He said. Oh, uh, oh so sorry, adapting <laughs> is dying. But then, um, but it works. But uh, I think no, no, no. It, it was both. It actually it's is both. It's actually there's both. a sign so. that says adapting wow. is surviving, and then, but then Oliver came on after that and said adapting. He kind of contradicted. No, but it's so interesting that you remembered adapting is surviving, and I remembered adapting is dying. I've had a bit more sleep. <laughs> I've had more sleep. I've, I'm not. I'm not jet lagged. <laughs> I think it's both. No. That, that was a very uh, um, eloquent and interesting and uh, wonderful answer, but that kind of a little bit avoided the question. Uh, I mean <laughs> you noticed, oh no. Okay. Um, so a little bit, because you know, writing a manifesto is also demanding something. You know, it's like, like, like putting up demands. Yeah. Um, so a little bit more like uh, to the point, do you demand movies implicitly or explicitly to react to political realities? Is that the, mo uh, the, the cinema that you want? Okay, now I'm going to put on my critic's hat and I'm going to say, filmmakers can make whatever films they want in the world. It's, they have the freedom to make whatever films they want. Of course, this is, a, uh, you know, uh, I'm saying this within quotes because not everybody has the same freedoms. White men have more freedom. Black women have less freedom. Indigenous women have even less freedom. So, um, not everybody has the same freedom. But, let's say filmmakers can choose their topics and make films on whatever they want. Critics have also the freedom to rate certain films highly, talk about certain films more, and rate other films less. So at this moment in the world, when, we're, um, when our climate is breaking down and there's xenophobia, there's sexism, there's racism, the world is a complete mess. Uh, I think that filmmakers should be making films that somehow speak to these realities. Films that completely turn away from these realities are going to be harshly judged by critics. That's what I can say. Thank you. I mean like Marvel films though. <laughs> <laughs> like like actually, everything else is up for I, interpretation. I, I, actually, I know a lot of uh, film scholar friends on Facebook who do great um, gender and racial analysis of Marvel films. I'm not a fan myself, so I've never actually seen them. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> but there are people who, who enjoy the you know, um, gender analysis and racial class analysis in those films. So there must be something there that comes out. But uh, I personally, uh, you know, we can't see all films, so we, we make choices. To oh, wait, so then are you saying then, since some people find political class analysis in Marvel films, that that in is included in your manifesto of films that should be made right now? Uh, the thing is, um, maybe so, because these some of these people I respect, and so I, I would want to watch the films first and see if I can test my own reactions against their analyses. But theoretically, <laughs> um, uh, and Nino and I were talking about this earlier, theoretically, I'm going to begin with the premise that all cinema has promise, has potential, and then I will subtract from that. <laughs> I'm feeling agitational right now. I like. It's <laughs> very good. <laughs> I no, want you to name you a film that something? you think should not have been made. <laughs> and Oliver, and then I will. We will slowly open up for the public. Uh, it's just sometimes it's also in reverse these effects. I wanted to add, like when you watch some of these Marvel films, and you see nothing of all at all in there, it still is, you know, because we are living in present time, so they are avoiding it, and by avoiding it, if they avoid it, so I don't watch too many Marvel films, but for example, also watching a James Bond movie nowadays, there is a lot of critique in there. Oh, but I stand by James Bond films. <laughs> no, one no yes. you just have, to, I've just taken random examples, but you just, you, sometimes it just turns weirdly in your head. It's reverse psychology <laughs> sometimes. I don't know, so. yeah, you know, film culture cannot avoid Marvel movies. I'll give you one good reason why. 
because of the carbon footprint in making Marvel movies. He's, he's huge. So it's, we burn so much energy in making those movies. Is it worth it? Well, this is a discussion we need to have. So I, I think all films should be discussed, um, maybe in different registers, uh, using different lenses, different paradigms, but film culture should discuss theoretically everything. I think there is just one thing we really have to do. We have to ask Ivana, what she thinks of Marvel movies. <laughs> Not that we know it from everybody else. Do you watch Marvel movies? Do you have this yeah. guilty pleasure? Yes, I do. Mm. Me too. Mm. Mm. I watched it. I mean, I grew up on it, so I, I love it. I mean, I, I was reading a lot of comics as well, but then... Me too. Well, But even though Neil, Ga Neil Gaiman was my favorite, he's not really, you know. Neil Gaiman is hard to turn into movies, I guess. Oh, okay, now we are going into know. fanboy oh, stuff. Yeah. Uh, let's open for the public. <laughs> are there any questions? Uh, please raise your hand so we can see you. Like, nobody's forced to ask a question because Dorota has a heavy jet lag and we can also just, like, um, have a more private conversation later. But I You can ask anything. <laughs> I see yeah, a question please, over anything. there. Let's just, uh, okay. Please. Yeah, I have one, one question to, to your right side, Nino. So to my to right the critic side? side and you know, you, if you think about movies, not only what you see, but only you, you see the context of a movie, who made the movie and uh, do you think this would make a difference or what would be the difference if Ivana the Terrible, despite the movie is like it is, would be made by a let's say a white male uh y you mean s sorry uh, just uh, rephrase the c a terrible movie made by a white no, man the no, exact no, no, same no, no. film ivana, but the, <laughs> ivana the terrible uh, the movie from you what would be the difference for you if this movie was made by i'm sorry no offense no, would no, made no. by a man um that's a that's a good uh that's a very good question uh if i could simply say that um, it's impossible to evaluate a text completely in isolation. So um, I saw the credits and I saw that Ivana made the film and she wrote the film. And so I also then, um, I trusted the fact that uh, Ivana's experience as a woman in the world flowed into the film and was part of the film. Um, but I also very much welcome men making films about women, men don't have the same experiences as bodies in the world, as they move through the world, as women do, but I trust men to have enough empathy to make films about women and make them well, but um, there's something special about actually being a woman and having the experiences that a woman has every moment in the world And so I'm going to trust that a little more, not to say that men can't make great films about women. So, so um, I think, Dunya, you can just take that mic maybe? We had the question so here um, and the question back there. Uh, just um, connecting with this question because I have seen, so I know Ivana actually from her previous film, uh, which was Soldiers, and I've seen the movie without knowing her, or um, I think I have, uh, even didn't read her name, so I just trusted the selection of the festival um, back then, and it was a film about um, homosexual um, community in uh, Romania with a scientist and a, a Roman um, a guy, so not at all what you think, not at all feminine um, uh, history, A rewriting of cinema but really it's and I really agree with um, the other guy there that um, you have to watch um, if you want to frame films um, because of the the hard facts so because of um, gender and uh, origin and period etc etc just to yeah so add okay thank you um, I would just go backwards, uh, the it would be here in the middle. Maybe the mic is long enough. <laughs> Hello. Um, 
I wanted to add um, that um, I've never seen um, a character like um, Ivana uh, before in a movie. I mean, um, movies about filmmakers who make uh, movies about their lives, um, uh, you can see plenty of them. I saw last week Abel Ferrara's Tomasio, so it's not really new, but I've never seen anything like this before. So um, that's a value in itself to see it from a woman's perspective. And I think this is uh, really quite remarkable. And um, I also uh, was quite um, fond of um, how flawed the character was because um, the films by the male directors are always a little bit vain, I think. It's always how they are always so uh, always about lux luxury problems, you know, about vain problems, I think. And this was much more radical and intimate and um, honest, it seemed to me. It's a compliment. <laughs> I mean, uh, the Ferrara film is quite good. I liked it, but it always um, hides its um, autobiography uh, behind tropes and genre conventions. And there's a lot of killing going on. And at the end, uh, there's always a question if this is all a fantasy and stuff like that. And uh, I'm really tired of that. You no, know, it's all just you've seen this a thousand times. But this is uh, more honest, I think, and this this was impressive thing. Thank you very much. You. <laughs> uh, we had a question really in the back, uh, so uh, the the microphone has to travel a little bit. Yeah. But um, a lot of praise. I, uh, <laughs> I was going to add. I like the idea of people of having not seen a lot of um, Central or South European films about women by women and believing that this is the one. Like this is this is how we are. <laughs> Because of the title, <laughs> I'm joking, <Because> but <laughs> <laughs> must be accurate. <laughs> so um, my thing, well, it wasn't really a question, but um, that was just a trigger thing when you, when that guy said, um, which guy? The you, guy someone you know. said, how would it have been if a man had made this film? Which is quite contentious in itself, isn't it? Why do we always have to say there's enough men making film? I make film too, but okay, the question is there. What would it have been like now? We have to imagine if a man had made it, yeah? So, of course, there would have been a lot more sex. Um, she would have had sex with him, wouldn't she? We would have seen the sex. We would have had to go through the sex. And I thought it was so great that Ivana was always stopping. Just There was a lot of sex in the, in the text, in the dialogue. And I thought it was great when she s shouted at her mother, I'm young, I need to have sex. I thought it was so fucking great. Um, and uh, it, she always stopped. There was a very sexuality and sensuality and intimacy and um, this age thing, but we didn't need the sex. And I thought that's how a woman would do it. And But then we had clitorises, which was really in your face, the clitorises. And, and a man probably wouldn't have the clitorises, he'd just have the bonking. And I thought it was great that we had this uh, really in your face thing about the clitorises, which everyone was really embarrassed about. But we had no sex, but we had the, the beautiful man and the beautiful woman who is very troubled, but a lot of intimacy and the family. Um, actually, I couldn't help thinking of Fellini somehow. There was this kind of group, always um, people traveling around in the landscape of the, not the landscape, but you know, the, the museum. It was very documentary. And um, you saw how people were reacting to the, the camera. And I thought it was an incredible achievement of Ivana to make this fantastic film, which was, in a way, like the Fellini aspect. It's very relaxed. We didn't know if there had been a lot of improvisation, but you say it was all scripted, which is incredible. And very brave to, you know, show your family with your own, maybe some of your own problems. And you say they were also uncomfortable, which you didn't even realize that they were uncomfortable because there's also the truth and the fiction. And and all these things, what is documentary and what is fiction, which uh, no one's really mentioned so much. Um, but as a filmmaker myself, like Uri Seidel, um, it's a little bit edgy sometimes, what is truth and what's fiction. And I thought that was fantastic, that we, it was really on edge. Uh, there was a lot of pushing towards this edge of um, rage and containment. Okay. And also with Oliver's film, um, I thought it was just uh, the, uh, sorry, um, speed it up. Um, I thought you were saying that the 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 city as the city is dead, 
And not that we're not that this uh, the city. I wasn't quite sure, but I felt like you were saying cities in themselves are about death. Cities okay. in themselves have killed the landscape. That's okay. all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. A fantastic so achievement, both of you. Fantastic achievement. That yeah. is uh, <laughs> something to take home. We have one last question. I'd say directly in the uh, middle, where it's dark. Uh, just a um, or did I oversee anybody and who feels uh, uh, no, that that will have to wait for afterwards uh, only one question per person so uh, except for me okay please yeah I have uh, one question for Oliver because uh, you were um, in your film you're using images with the yellow vest protest so using images of people who fight for their rights and who fight against injustice at the same time you use footage of people having sex who I guess don't know that their footage has been used you don't see much of them, but maybe you see enough. Was that a moral question for you by in the editing process to think about, can I use this footage? B because people maybe could find out we are now part of a film. Um, is this something you thought about by taking it in or leaving it out when you, when you edited your movie? Yes, yes, it was. Um, it was a big moral question for me. And as I said earlier, like um, when I took it out, I missed something. And then I asked myself why I'm missing something, because I don't really miss these images in the world. So um, then I thought about the, the picture, the, the pictures of manifestations that we usually get. And I felt like this is really obscene because seeing people manifest is demonstrate is also something very sensual. And this was also one of the reasons why I couldn't have these images as running images or something like that. And so this material mixing itself in a way uh, was stunning to me because I felt the strong connection between people like going out collectively and then being filmed upon and then being reproduced as for some kind of mass media relations and they are being talked about. And especially in the terms of Yellow Vest protesters, the talk about them, it was really whack. It was really not getting the point. Uh, it was always asking for get a leader, get your arguments together and then please come back. So don't be childish and actually this is what I felt is also happening with sex in a lot of ways like when we are seeing images of sex uh, they are always like generalized they are like so far taken away from that but these images they were really like um, obscene in that way to me that it was more like in a way like a rape um, it was not a rape but it was consensual but for me seeing it and this experience I, I felt really guilty and I had that moral thing going on and so then did the, the combination of them two really made sense for me in that very moment and I just decided to leave it like that does that answer your question for the moment no I think I think what he says is that the moral struggle was there but stayed unresolved to a certain yeah degree. I mean it, it cannot be resolved uh, there are m many images in this world they just um, uh, the moment they become images, they they don't exist as what they are. Um, I mean, this is like common sense. We all know that in a way. And we're all making images up all the time. And then we're seeing images. And every time it goes through the subjectiveness of one person, it changes its meaning. And so, um, yeah, I really wanted to take um, a take on that. So thank you very much, Girish. Thank you. Thank you. Ivana. Thank Olivia. you both. All of you. <laughs> Come back tomorrow. Come back tomorrow to the Critics Week. Uh, there's going to be the super, super secret special screening double feature, trouble feature, I think is even the uh, title. So uh, if you're in for an experiment, um, always come. If you're in for a special experiment, come tomorrow. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>